of this teaching on Israel and their relationship with Gaza and in particular with Hamas and um, this whole teaching has been called Milk and Honey and uh, before I get into it I want to let you know next Wednesday night there will be no Bible study here we're taking a week off we will meet two weeks from tonight on July 9th we'll start again okay so going into 4th of July next week I don't know how many of you know this but Stephanie and I our anniversary is July 1st we're trying our best to kind of sneak away and just kind of get out get out of town for a little bit we'll see if if, if our schedules will let that happen we really kind of toying with it maybe even just a staycation I don't know we might even, we'll see but um, it always falls at 4th of July weekend and so um, Pastor Dale will be preaching on July 6th on that Sunday. Um, but I'm not, I'm not 100% certain, but I do know that next Wednesday night in here, nothing in this room, okay? Youth will be meeting, but nothing in this room for adults, okay? So just want to make sure, and of course I'll mention that on Sunday as well, but I want to make sure all of you know it. Uh, I want to title this last installment of the teaching, Shared Space. And... Um, one of the things that's made this difficult is I'm squeezing probably about 12 weeks of material into four weeks. And so because of that, uh, I've just been rolling through lecture material. I mean, it literally is just a one hour lecture each time we get together. It, the first three times I tried to cut it shorter than that, but it just didn't happen. And I, I think um, tonight I'm hoping to be able to finish a little sooner than I have the, the previous three. Uh, but because of that, it's not a typical Wednesday night. I've said this each Wednesday night uh, of this series. On Wednesday nights, we like to brag that equip is uh, light on lecture and heavy on interaction. And we really value discussion and interaction that way. But um, not in this series. Now, if I finish in time, if I finish in time, then at the end of the session tonight, I'm hoping to have a little space. If any of you have any questions, a time for Q&A. Um, but famous last words and no promises. All right, here we go. Shared space is what we're talking about tonight. Shared space, um, space physically and, and space um, emotionally and spiritually and space in time. Shared space between Israel and all of their neighbors. Um, we've covered a, a lot of territory in the three sessions about Israel, Gaza, and Hamas tonight, this last session in Milk and Honey. I want to talk really about three different topics underneath shared space. First, the reasons why Jerusalem is the epicenter for the religions of the world. It is really a special place. And we're going to talk about what makes it so special. Two, the sometimes confusing topic of Christian Palestinians. Sometimes people think, well, that's an oxymoron. The two don't go together. But actually, there are a number of Palestinians who love the Lord Jesus. And then number three, um, and in fact, we're going to start on this one in reverse order. Um, so before the other two, but this is the third one, we're going to spend a few minutes on the comparison between the book of Esther and what's happening right now between Israel and Hamas. Um, Hamas. The word's meaning. What does Hamas mean? Well, it's not an American word. You know, we hear it in the news now, but we don't really truly understand the etymology of where the word comes from. It's an Arabic phrase, and I'm going to do my best to butcher it for you. It's Haracha al Muhawama al Islamia. And it means, in English, Islamic resistance movement. In Arabic, the transliteration would be three letters. It's an abbreviation, it's an acronym, HMS. But to us, we would say um, Islamic Resistance Movement. HMS, though, and that's where you can see, fill in the, the vowels in between, and you get 
Hamas. Uh, Hamas was glossed in the 1988 Ham Hamas Covenant by the Arabic word, and it. And by the way, 1988. I wonder if they did it in honor of you and me, baby. That's. There, let me. Do you have time for just a little brief story? So we got married in 1988. We went to Egy's to eat uh, just fast food in Tucson. If you ever have had Egy's, it's really good. You know, it's burger joint or sand, well, really sandwiches, sandwiches. But the thing they're famous for, they call it an EG. It's an ice slushy fruit drink, and it is so delicious. And so um, she had it when she lived in Tucson, and they're just now coming to the valley. I don't know, are there four of them around the valley? We're waiting for one to come to the West Valley. If you get a chance to get an EG, it's really good. Uh, it's spelled E E G E E E G S. That's the name of the restaurant. Yeah, e that's the name of it. <clears throat> but we go to the counter, we we order our food, and and most importantly the E G. And and then they bring the number. And they say your number is eighty eight. And I took the number, and I said, look at that eighty eight. And Stephanie says, oh, does that remind you of anything? And I said, yes, it does. Drew Pearson, the wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys, was number 88. I was just playing with her, okay? So um, she, she puts up with a lot with me. Anyway, I do digress. That's how we don't get to the Q&A, by stuff like that. I'm sorry, okay? So 1988, Hamas decides that this is going to be our covenant. And, and they tell us that Hamas means zeal, strength, and bravery. Or they will even say, even enthusiasm, which I take offense at because enthusiasm is a uniquely Christian word. Enthusiasm comes to us through Latin, but it means inspired by God. And um, so I, I do not think that fits with Hamas at all. Um, Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages, but the Hebrew meaning of Hamas is violence. And I think that that's much more accurate. Their other dic dictionary definition is cruelty, injustice, but not the word zeal. So you can see that right off the bat, there's different meanings to different people for what Hamas means. Um, but just for a moment, let's review the story of Esther. I'm going to give you the bird's eye flyover super fast. Queen Esther is secretively a Jew. Mordecai, her uncle, uncovered a conspiracy against the king. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time and he overheard it and he saves the king's life. In time, Queen Esther's uncle Mordecai also learns that there's a plot to annihilate the Jews. Do you remember this story? And so, uh, the plot is being carried out by a wicked man in the king's cabinet named Haman. Mordecai warns his niece, she's not exempt just because she's the queen. You may have been put in this position for such a time as this. Remember those words. And, and so Esther calls a three-day fast. And at the end of the three-day fast, um, well, I should say during that time, meantime, Haman demands Jews to bow down to him, but Mordecai refuses to. He won't do it. And then, at the end of the three days, she risked everything. The queen risked everything to go and appear before the king when she has not been summoned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very risky. I mean, she could have died. This is a king who says, off with the head of the previous queen. It doesn't bode well for her. So, he extends the scepter of peace to her. It's a miracle. And... She asked for King Xerxes and Haman to come for a banquet, and the king tells her at the banquet, uh, is there anything you, she, that you want? And she asked only that the king and Haman come again tomorrow for another banquet. And then that night, serendipitously, Haman schemes with his family for Mordecai 
and other Jews, no doubt, to die impaled on a pole that he's erected. He's wanting to kill the Jews. But that same night, the king is having trouble sleeping. So he ordered his court reporter to bring the chronicles and read to him some bedtime reading. And he discovered that Mordecai had never been honored for uncovering this first conspiracy against the king. And so in the early morning hours, as, as wicked Haman is coming to appear before the king, the king says to one of his servants, who is out in the court? Who's out in the courtyard? Oh, that's Haman. Oh, good. Tell Haman to come on inside here. And when Haman walks in, he says to him, uh, Haman, what would the king do to honor somebody that he really wishes to honor? And Haman thinks, he's talking about me. He wants to honor me. And so he gives the command, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and let him sit on the king's horse and, and put the royal crest beside him on its head and, and then let the robe and horse be entrusted to the one of the king's noble princes and let them robe the man that the king delights as, as the king's clothes and parade him through the streets and shout out before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And then the king tells him, oh, that's great. That's all so great, Haman. You go and do that for Mordecai, who's out there sitting at the gate. And uh, they, they do that. I mean, can you imagine how embarrassed, how sh ashamed he is, how he's, he's humiliated. This guy wouldn't even bow before me now. I have to exalt him, parade him through, and give him honor. Uh, it's just the most amazing irony but then they get back in time to be escorted to the king's banquet again. And the queen has ready for them. And, and the king says, what do you wish, my wife, my bride, O oh queen? Anything you want up to half the kingdom, it's yours. And she says, what I would really like is for my people to be spared from the wicked one who wants to annihilate us. Who is he, O oh queen? He is this man, Haman, who's sitting at the table with you. And so it all blows up. God delivers the Jews in an amazing miracle. Here's the ironies of Esther and today. King Xerxes is Persian. Do you remember that? Nebuchadnezzar was Babylonian. He's the one that took the Jews off into exile. They're in Babylon. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son, probably more likely his grandson, Belteshazzar, sees the hand writing on the wall. And that very night, he has been so disrespectful, so dishonoring to God, and God calls him to judgment. And mene, mene, tekel, tekel, I can't remember exactly, but you've been weighed and found wanting, and this very night you'll come under judgment. That very night was the same night that Darius the Mede took over the, the kingdom. And so the Babylonians fall to the Persians. And, and uh, that's who the Medes were. They were Persians. And so Xerxes is one after Darius down in the line. And then uh, Artaxerxes, his son, he was Persian as well. Eventually one of the Persian kings was named Cyrus. And Cyrus says, you Jews can go back to your homeland. And in fact, guess what? The Persians are going to pay for the rebuilding of the temple. That was an incredible miracle. So Persians, uh, that's just that's the, the same people that, that through history now the Jews are still fighting to this day. The Persians are the forerunners of Hamas. And Haman is very similar to Hamas. Even the name is similar. In fact, um, I, um, I, I want to be sure and give credit to my son Zach. He's the one that pointed this out to me. He told me Hamas and Haman are the same. And I started researching it and I found that he's exactly right. 
Uh, who are the, the Persians? They are Iran and Iraq of our day. And Haman, he received funding from the Persians to attack the Jews until it was, un until it was discovered. That's exactly what Hamas does. That's the very thing that's in the news right now. That Hamas has been funded by Iran and by Iraq to come through the back door entrance into Gaza Strip and to attack the Israelis. Um, so we're, I'm not the only one that thinks that. The World Jewish Congress uh, did a meme. If we, if we did have the screens, I would show you the meme. Um, the World Jewish Congress on their Facebook page says H-A-M-A -A, and then up here it has S and then a line and then N. Hamas. Haman. And they say on that meme, um, we recognize the similarities. And that's the Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress. And then listen to this quote by, uh, this is a traditional synagogue in, Ger uh, in Toronto. It's Beth Emet Bais Yehuda. I, I remember that Beth Emet means uh, house of truth. I, the rest of it I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to search it up. But um, they say, quote, the story of Purim and Hamas is really one and the same. A despot intends to wipe out every single Jew. It is perhaps more than ironic that the spelling of and the evil of Haman is almost identical to the spelling of and evil of Hamas. We must read the name Hamas into the name of Haman. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's quite a quote. Wow. So I just want to remind you that in week one we said um, Benjamin Netanyahu on the night that the Prime Minister of Israel declared war uh, against Hamas, these are the words he said, quote, You must remember what Amalek has done to you. So says our Holy Bible and we do remember, end quote. What he was referring to is Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. I'll read it for you again if you want to follow along. It's verses 17 through 19. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you and the land He's given you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So who were the Amalekites? In Old Testament folklore, they were the ones who struck from behind. They were the ones that targeted the back of the caravan. So you can imagine Israel marching through on her journey towards a promised land, Amalek doesn't have the courage to come out and face them in war head on, but instead they hide in the ravines and in the crags up in the mountains and they watch Israel go by and then they come around from behind and they attack the back. That means they're attacking the feeble, the elderly, the women and the children. And, and God said, you have to remember what Amalek did. And it's amazing that Netanyahu quoted that. Um, Haman, from Esther's story, he was an Amalekite. And the Jews, they read Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19 every year when they celebrate Purim. Every year they read that passage of Scripture first, and then they read the entire story of Esther. So... Um, yeah, I really wanted to share some more about that, and I just I find that amazing that the same age-old battle of the centuries is still going on and using virtually the same players, almost the same name, for sure the same spirit, the same battle is going on. Now, the second thing I want to talk with you about, let's talk about Jerusalem. Jerusalem just um, is, I mentioned in the opening, it is the epicenter for world religions. 
I don't think I have to tell you this, three major world religions all claim Jerusalem as their beginning place. Um, for Christians, no doubt, Jerusalem is the place where Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. So, so for us, it's a very important place. It's a very special place, a beautiful place. Um, it's just a 10 minute walk from the temple to the place where Jesus' crucifixion took place. His burial tomb is right close by and, and of course, the site of His resurrections. Christians, for obvious reasons, believe that Jerusalem is a very important location. Um, you can go to the place where Jesus was buried. Um, recent archaeological discoveries are really confirming more and more that um, the place inside the Church of the Sepulchre, they have a little church within a church. In fact, it's a massive complex. And if, if you're standing on the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock is and, and you look out over the walls, it's just right out there. You can see the Church of the Sepulchre. And so they have this little church inside of a church. It's really it's become a shrine. I'm not into this sort of thing, but I know that for many it's very, very special to go there, to go in and see the place where they believe He was laid. And uh, I wish so much that I could show you uh, a graph, a picture that I found of what has happened through the centuries with the topography of the land and then the way the church of the sepulchre has been built over it. And it's, it's really remarkable. You can see it all uh, right there. Uh, but um, yeah, you can go to the place where his body was laid. And Golgotha, all four Gospels say that Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull. Uh, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, John 19. They all call it the place of the skull. Uh, the Greek word is kranion. It's where we get our word cranium. It wasn't just, an, uh, just a, a, a name that was drawn out of a hat or just the, uh, out of the thin air. It actually looks like a skull. Now, if you go there in, in modern times today and step up on top of, of the roof to look across, it's changed, it started decaying. Uh, in mid parts of last century, there were pictures of the place of the skull. And it is remarkable. Some of you might recall that about three years ago, I did this series on Sunday mornings and I, I had the, the rock, the granite rock of the place of the skull, the mountain had that on the screen. And I told you, I was just curious, and I wondered what it would look like if you took the Shroud of Turan and superimposed what they say the face of Christ may have looked like. I just wondered what it would look like. And I mean, if it didn't fit beautifully and perfectly over the place of the skull, where the eye cavities, you can see the nasal cavity and all of that, and I know that's not scientific and it doesn't mean anything, but it's just one of those things that sort of makes you go, hmm, that's interesting. And then Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, 20 minutes away from Jerusalem, all of that happens there for Christians. But of course it's very, very special. Jerusalem is very, very special to Jews. The Mount of Olives. Um, it's special to Christians and to Jews. But the Jewish uh, belief of Zechariah 14 and the Christian belief of Zechariah 14 differ, but I think they lead to the same result through different directions. But where it says that the Lord will descend onto the Mount of Olives and that there will be an earthquake and life-giving water will flow from that place two directions, to the Dead Sea and to the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, it, it speaks of... Um, true peace and the king ruling over all. You know what's interesting to me is that Mount of Olives uh, still to this day it's, it's beautiful, it's green, it's pretty. You can look 
from the Mount of Olives and see right across the, the valley to the Temple Mount. And, um, but there's also a graveyard up there. Lots of, um, I'm trying to think of the fancy word for the concrete, uh, what is it? Yeah, mausoleum, kind of like that. Um, there's bunches of them all on, on the top and the belief for the Jewish people is that when Messiah comes and lands on Mount, uh, on the Mount of Olives that, that Zechariah's earthquake will happen that he prophesies and that there will be resurrections of people who have died. They will come to life and I'm thinking, wow, if they just only knew that is their Messiah coming back that we know to be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second uh, Kings chapter 21 verse 4 gives an interesting verse. He built altars in the temple of the Lord of which the Lord had said, quote, in Jerusalem I will put my name. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's just very interesting. Uh, there are three valleys in and around Jerusalem. One goes straight like this. One curves around this way. And another one curves around this way. And when you look at the lay of the land, it looks like God just took His finger and wrote the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet right into the ground. It is remarkable. Um, it's the same... Uh, the same lettering for Shem, the, the, a lot of Jewish people have that on the doorpost of their house where it, the command from Old Testament is put the name of the Lord on your doorpost. They, they have that letter. And uh, it represents the presence of God. So, so Jerusalem, it's special to Christians and Jews alike. And of course the land was promised uh, to Abraham um, by God and, and uh, the site of the temple, the place where the glory of God dwells in the temple. Uh, so many times already in this series we've talked about how the land is so very, very special to the Jews. So the Christians, the Jews, what about the Palestinians? Why do Muslim people have such a high regard for the Temple Mount where they have their mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock. Why do they claim that? Well, I'm going to tell you about what Muslims believe, the Prophet's night vision. This is referred to as the Prophet's night vision. Let me run through it real quick. Islam uh, has the tradition that it was the year 621 um, the prophet Muhammad was in Mecca he died in the year 632 so this is before his death um, and it's important for, for Christians to realize that Islam is not an ancient religion before Christianity six centuries passed and then Islam comes on the scene making outlandish claims. Um, but in the year 621, uh, the prophet Muhammad uh, supposedly was visited by the angel Gabriel, who wakes him up and leads him to his winged horse, uh, a light creature named Barak. Don't let that throw you. Barak is just a name that means blessed. Um, but he climbs on the back of this horse named Barak, and off they go. Um, they passed, they fly in the air and they pass through Bethlehem and they come to Jerusalem to the Temple Mount. And there, Muhammad meets Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, among others in this, um, at this traditional site. He, he's acting like the Imam to them. He's acting like they're the Muslim form of the priest. He's guiding them. He's directing them. <clears throat> uh, Mohammed is taken by Gabriel to heaven. He meets Adam. He meets Jesus there. He meets John the Baptist. He meets other prophets. He meets Joseph, Aaron, Moses, Abraham. 
And he's taken from there to a unique place that's beyond the divine veil into what's known as the seventh heaven. And at that point, even Gabriel wasn't allowed to go with him anymore. Uh, while Muhammad goes through the veil, he hears a voice saying, Allahu Akbar, which means Allah is great. Allah is greater. It's the thing that terrorists shout before they trigger the bomb. Uh, Muslims believe that here the Prophet meets with Allah and speaks with Him and it's during this meeting that Allah prescribes the daily ritual prayer for Muslims. He actually instructed Muhammad that you all must pray 50 times a day. So Muhammad descends back down and, and he meets with, uh, with, with Moses and Moses says, oh no, that's, that's way too much, that's way too much. You've you got to go back and negotiate it down a little bit. We can't pray 50 times a day. And so there's sort of this back and forth. And, and so Muhammad goes back in. He says, you know, Allah, we can't do 50 times. They, there's some back and forth and some banter. And he, he whittles it down until finally the command comes. You must pray the prescribed daily prayers five times a day. And that's why Muslims uh, pray five times a day. And then from there, he was ushered on the wings of the horse back to Mecca and then the vision was over. Um, that story is a, um, a pride of place among, among Muslims. Because what it does, without any authority, it equates Muhammad without, without any backing, without any uh, textual criticism, without any archaeological proof, with, with no history, all of a sudden he's got this pride of place and uh, he's greater than the other prophets and he's up here and there down here and he's greater than them and, and it's the cornerstone for Islam's claim to be the true heirs of Abraham. The Christians have got it wrong, the Jews have got it wrong, we're the true heirs of Abraham. Uh, the truest revelation, the purest expression of divine revelation of the one true God. And their claim of divine authority from Muhammad, it secures their justification to say, look, the Temple Mount, that belongs to us. It's more important that we are here than anybody else. Um, so much history taking place in one city, Jerusalem. And so I wanted, uh, I, I wanted to mention that simply because honestly until I researched it a little bit, I didn't know what, what Muslims really believe. I mean, I know that they have Ramadan and that they fast during that month but they eat like crazy after sunset and then they fast again during the daytime. Some I've heard some Muslim people that are not really true, ardent, practicing Muslims who say, man, it is the biggest feast all month long. I just don't eat during the day, sunshine hours, but boy, it's a big party every night. Now I'm sure there are others who are much more serious about it. Um, but when I hear that, I just I want to say, on what do you base that? On one man's experience that is so subjective that doesn't have any support. I'm very thankful for the rich heritage that we have in the Bible that can withstand close scrutiny that was in formation over a period of 1,600 years with more than 40 different authors, three different languages, all walks of life. One's a king, one's a fisherman, one's a doctor, one's a tax collector. And yet all of them speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in their own unique style, writing as God tells them to write in their own unique ways. But no contradictions. The Bible is a miracle book. And I wish more people would dig deeply into it and see 
what it truly is all about because it answers our question. Well, the last thing that I, I wanted to talk with you about uh, tonight is um, to close out this, this series, I want to talk about this. What about Palestinian Christians? I, I think I've laid the groundwork through the four weeks to say that Hamas is a mean, dictative, evil, um, just a, a tyrannical group of terrorists who want to destroy. Now, I don't blame people for being Palestinian. There are many people that are Palestinian who don't want that, who just simply, they just want to live. Um, so, some Palestinians have actually embraced the exact opposite of what most of them do. Most of them become Muslims. Sort of like Stephanie and I lived in the West Slope of Colorado for 11 years, and, and uh, it's heavily populated Mormon territory. Um, it's not too far. We have been to downtown Salt Lake to, to see, I mean, and to go in and just visit. There's a lot of a lot of Mormons all throughout that area. And there are people that uh, the locals would call Jack Mormons. And what they meant by that was, well, they're sort of Mormon because the family is Mormon and then, you know, they just sort of, that's just because that's what mom and dad were, I became that, but they weren't really too serious about it. There are many Jack Muslims that don't really even know the the entire foundations of, of their background and their belief. And, and um, so they, they fall into a category that they say, listen, uh, Islam is, is not a mean religion, it's a peaceful one. We all want to live in peace. But the history does not bear that out. It just simply does not. So, uh, and yet, there are many Palestinians who have embraced faith in Christ. And so what to do about that? How does that fit into my theological baggage? What do I do? You mean there's people that live in hostile territory that love Jesus? There are. And uh, Jack Sarah is the president of Bethlehem Bible College. It's amazing to me that Bethlehem is in the territory of the Palestinians right now. And uh, Bethlehem Bible College... Um, is is predominantly Palestinians who attend it. Um, he is, Jack Sarah, is one of the most influential voices for Palestinian Christian leaders in the world. Like many Palestinian Christians, Jack traces his roots in the faith not back decades, not even back centuries, but get this, he traces it back millennia. He says that we have been uh, part of the Christian presence that's been in the Holy Land since the days of Jesus. Yep. That's remarkable. Now, what happens is that through the centuries, names and titles and, and uh, labels take on different meanings all through through the centuries. And there's the emergence and then it goes away and then the re-emergence and things like this. But he says that people ask him, ask him all the time. So all the time I get this question, wait now, there's Palestinian Christians? No way! Bible believing? Yeah. Evangelical? Yes. Spirit filled? Yes. Now that's his words. And I, I don't think I'm not sure that he would define evangelical the way that I would define it. I'm not sure that he would define spirit filled the way that I would define it. But here's a man who has embraced faith in Christ. And um, this, he says, quote, this fact sometimes makes a hard shift because it's not an Islam slash Jewish war. There is another reality on the ground I need to explore. And what do they think? 
and how do they live and how do they survive. Um, the majority of Christians in the Palestinian territories are either Catholic or Orthodox with a handful of other traditions, traditions sprinkled in. Evangelicals began to make a significant move in the 19th century and according to Jack Serra, um, they made significant impact in the early 1900s and Christian evangelicalism was growing in the Palestinian uh, territory up until 1948. And so what happened in 1948? Well, that's when Israel became a physical state. All my life I've rejoiced in that. I see that as the fulfillment of prophecy. But I also haven't thought of the other side of it because when that happened, it meant the displacement of, over the coming years, the displacement of 750,000 Palestinians, including many Christian Palestinians. And so, how do we deal with that? What, what do we do with that? Well, let me just tell you what, what I've observed. And, and this comes from one guy one voice from a very limited view as a spirit-filled Pentecostal Christian who has lived the entirety of his life in America in a Western context, unable to be on the land seeing and observing and meeting and interacting with people and not knowing all of the history. But I really do think this is accurate. I, see, I believe there's two different theologies that describe the views of what's happening in, in Palestine right now. First one is dispensationalism. I do not describe myself as a hard and fast dispensationalist, but I lean that way. If I could say it that way, I lean towards the belief. If you don't know what that huge, big word is, well, let's just talk about it for a moment. Dispensationalism means that there were different epochs of time, different dispensations of time, all of them lining up with the covenants that are lined out in the Bible and leading up to the end time. And so a, a dispensationalist would say precisely what I said a moment ago, that in 1948, when Israel became a state again after 2,000 years, this was the fulfillment of prophecy that God brought this about. Now that's my view. I truly believe that. I believe that, that God did this. Um, and so that's one view. Dispensationalism. The other view is what is sometimes referred to as replacement theology. And for my liking, I, I disagree with this, with this teaching. But I want to share with you so that you understand, well, here's what some people say. And this is what a lot of Palestinian Christians believe. This uh, replacement theology means that once Jesus rose from the dead, all of the promises and blessings that were mentioned for Israel, guess what? Anybody that comes to faith in Christ all of that, all of Israel is replaced with now that only belongs to us. So in other words, the, the promises in Scripture about Israel, they're not necessarily uh, literal, physical promises. They're spiritual blessings that as a believer, I, I replace them with my views and my, my acceptance of Christ. I receive all of those blessings. Well... All of us would say, hey, um, especially those of us like me, I'm not a Jew, but I've been engrafted into the vine. Praise God, we believe that, right? 
Um, I, I'm part of the covenant of God. I'm, I'm not an Israeli, but I'm his child. I've been adopted into the family. But I do believe that it's dangerous territory to just wholesale dismiss 2,000 years of written record and just suddenly say, all of a sudden now it's replaced. I, I think you're yeah, getting into right. dangerous territory. Now, here's also something that I want to say. I think the reason that I get really nervous about making predictions and prophecies and, and you know, <laughs> writing books... <laughs> 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988 or what have you. And then it was 89. And then 89. And laughing all the way to the bay. Or any number of different ones that I love. I love to read. I love all the teachings. And I've, I've you know, heard a lot of different people make predictions. But one of the reasons that I'm so careful and guarded about it is because, because of what I just said a moment ago. I am an American Pentecostal living in the Western world. I view things from this vantage point. My whole life I've seen it this way. But God Almighty, I, I don't want to break it to you, but God, I hope this doesn't burst your bubble. God is not a 58-year-old white Republican <laughs> Christian. God is above us. Right, he's, on, he's so His ways are so much higher than ours. And, and any time we begin to act like, oh, I've, boy, I've got it figured out, we find out there's things we will never be able to know about Him. And so the way I describe it, I think it's like my wife. She's a wonderful photographer. And she's got her, her camera. And she will turn the zoom lens and all of a sudden, you can be zoomed in on something way, way over there. I mean, you can see it so clear. But then when she turns it back, it spreads back this way. And, and suddenly, you don't see that one thing, but now you're seeing the big picture. And I think that God's the only one in control of the camera. Yeah. I, I just feel like to, for any of us to say, I've got all the answers, but we do not. He's continually zooming in and out, and he's continually looking at it uh, from his vantage point. But um, here was a a comment um, from one Jewish leader. Uh, it, well, first I should say that I, I forgot to put this in my notes. I just thought of it. The the pastor of of the church in, um, <clears throat> I want to say it's in Bethlehem. I want to say it's Bethlehem Evangelical Church. He's a Christian man. He's Palestinian. I, I don't have his name in front of me. I wish I'd written this down, but it just pops in my mind. It, they, they have planted churches all throughout the area. Um, he laughed when he said, we even have a church in uh, Haifa, Israel, a Palestinian Christian church. Um, I guess, I mean, I don't know the lay of the land, but I just imagine that's a pretty big deal. I mean, that's something they don't expect you to accomplish, but they do. And he says all the time people come to me and say, well, you know what? The, Israel, the Israelis, they're, they're our enemy. Uh, we have to destroy them. And he said to them, I say to them all the time, we're not going to choose one side or the other. We're not going to listen to the propaganda. We will only listen to the Scripture and we will only do what Jesus did when He was on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Now, that's amazing. That's coming from a Palestinian talking about Jewish people. That we will not judge we will, we will regret when Hamas does horrible things. We publicly say we denounce it. We don't agree with it. But by the same token, we will do what Paul taught us to do in 1 Corinthians. Love everyone. If you say you're a follower but you don't have love, 
and it's nothing but a resounding gong. I find that remarkable. And then here's a comment from a Jewish leader, um, and I, I wish I had his name. I almost want to call it, but it got as I was scrambling this afternoon. I forgot to put his name down. But this was this was his comment. He said, I absolutely believe that someday we will live and coexist side by side in peace. And he says, 70 years ago, who would have ever thought that Germans would be kind to Jews? Think about that. But he said, now, every year, there's a team of German people who come here to Israel and they help us by planting gardens and vineyards and flowers. And they simply say, we want to undo what our forefathers did to you. We want to bless the Jews. That's a miracle. I mean, think about that in 70 years' time. And then this one quote, I, several weeks I had the picture on the screen by Zion Lashem. <clears throat> a picture of him and his family. And when he was asked about, Zion, what do you think about it? When, um, when Hamas came into the Moshav uh, Neva, where you, your city, where you live, and, and killed many people and, and just was so cruel, he said, the part of me wants to just lash out them at them with so much hatred and so much anger. And he said, I can say honestly, I hate them with a pure hatred, like David said in the Psalms. But then he says, but what I really want, I pray for the day when we can beat our swords into plowshares and live at peace with our neighbors. See, because in the final anal analysis, all humans are human. All races need Jesus. I'm going to close with these words from my son, Zach. Uh, he, he emailed me a, a few weeks back and he said, Dad, just a quick question. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, aren't we really praying for the return of Jesus? And I said, I think you're absolutely right. Because true peace won't come until the Prince of Peace comes. And yet we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, what do you know, I landed the plane at 8.06. We're going to have prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, but... Um, I'm not an expert by any stretch, but I just wonder, has any of the last four weeks, has it created a question that you have? Anybody want to ask anything? And I'll do my best. Any, any comments? Yeah. I, I'm just wondering, if, you know, what, what's your opinion? Is Israel, this might not be popular here, but is, is Israel over... Uh, overstepping what the, the correct response would be. Yeah. That's a, a great question that I don't I don't have the the answer to. Is Israel going too far in the way they are trying to obliterate Hamas and the Palestinians? And I, I think I'm okay with warriors like Hamas getting what they deserve. Yeah. Where it becomes very hard for me is when little families don't get milk and bread and are starving. Um, here, here's the thing that I would like to, I don't know if I have an answer, but I would like to zoom the lens out a little bit away from that people are starving and there's been so much bloodshed, but just to kind of back up and put perspective on it. Um, when 
when there are atrocities like this in other parts of the world, whether it's Darfur, um, or if it's, for instance, right now, people afraid to go back to Afghanistan because of the Taliban. Because they are so cruel. And if, if I go back to my homeland, I'll be obliterated. There's, a, there's an outcry against that sort of stuff, don't get me wrong. But for some reason, when, when Israel defends herself, yeah. it just it goes to another level. Um, the, the scores of people that have died, I, my heart breaks. Um, but compared to other, other retaliations where far more, and we're talking hundreds of thousands more, have died that have sort of just been hush hush. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't make it right, but it makes me wonder what is it about Israel that makes them the bad guy when they try to defend themselves. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I have the answer to that. That's a terrific question, Gordy, because. Um, for you and me, when we zoom in and we see the pain and the suffering, it's just like, oh my goodness. And, and uh, even one of the people who lives in, in one of, one of the uh, kibbutz just on the other side of the fence in Israeli territory, but they've been the ones working for peace, working for peace, working for peace. After October 7th, he and thousand others have said, we threw our hands up, we're done with peace. They don't understand anything but force. These, these are the ones that have been striving and saying, no, 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 don't attack, don't attack. But now they're saying, boy, I hope we obliterate them and I hope there is no ceasefire because if we get a ceasefire, then it'll be just, whether it's nine months or 18 months, they'll do it again. And here's the thing about it. Hamas used the last 17 years in Gaza they didn't build one solitary item towards community. All they did, now we're finding out, they dug tunnels under the ground for 17 years to strategize and plan. They are perfectly okay with... Here's one thing that happened. In the early days of the war, there was a bomb that went off and it happened at one of the hospitals. And boy, I mean, it hit the media and everybody from the New York Times to CNN, everybody was saying, how dare you do this to a hospital? And then, of course, it comes out over time and they don't ever go back and, and correct it. But it was actually not an Israeli bomb. It was from Hamas and it went the wrong direction. Right. And nobody ever corrected it. And there was no, at first they said 500 died and then, well, maybe it's a little less. And now they're saying it, was, it may have been far less than that and that it was caused by Hamas, but Hamas seems to be perfectly okay with, we'll kill some of our own civilians, we'll make Israel look bad, because they don't play fair. So I just, I'm just saying, it's complicated. It's really, really complicated. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing about Israel, they don't start it, but they definitely finish it. Yeah. And they always take more land, and I think that's because they're blessed with God. Yeah, and I, I, I'm i not sure how... Um, I, you know, earlier when I said you've got two crowds, one that says dispensationalism, the other view um, that is entirely different, um, that is about replacement theology. There are people that believe the reason Americans can't see the truth of what's happening there is because we're too similar. We are the product of colonialism. We did the same thing to Native American tribes when we came from England centuries ago. The same thing that Israel is doing to the Palestinians now. We just can't see it. We're blind to our own. We have a blind spot. But I don't, I don't see it that way. If, if anybody has refused to sign peace treaties and agreements and covenants. It's Hamas right. all through the years. 
They have refused opportunity after opportunity. At first, the Jewish people were only going to receive 20% of the land. And they said, no, no, no. And now that Israel has flourished through the decades, they're, they're screaming more and more. So it's complicated.